first, I want to welcome everyone, eh, the students' cultural management, the alumni, uh, the colleagues, and also uh, our friends who are interested in uh, research in cultural management and cultural policy. And uh, probably you know it, but uh, each year, the Fund for Cultural Management of the University of Antwerp alternately presents an award for a thesis or a doctoral study. And last year, it was a turn for a master thesis in cultural management or policy. In doing so, the fund aims to spread the new knowledge, uh, to stimulate the quality of management practices in the cultural and creative sectors, and to offer opportunities to young researchers. Last year, we had a rich collection of submissions. We had uh, 27 uh, submissions from nine different countries. So uh, yeah, really a um, diverse uh, uh, number of uh, theses. The jury of the award is composed of uh, seven uh, experts uh, from the academic world and uh, the cultural sector in Flanders and abroad. And as a result, uh, there were three nominations, and these are the three guests of today. Uh, Jenny Pecarini, uh, Maike van Leendert, and Alice de Matos Guimares. For uh, more information about their thesis, um, you can uh, download them from our website. Eh? So uh, you can uh, read them, but of course, eh, it's... Uh, they are uh, quite thick, so this uh, afternoon uh, we are going to listen to their um, summary, their sub presentation for 20 minutes, and then uh, we will have each time a 10-minute uh, Q&A. Um, so they are going to uh, share with you the results of their research, and the topics are really very different. Uh, Jenny will talk about... Uh, how to foster cultural participation to address youth disillusion, disillusionment. So uh, it is at the occasion of uh, the European cultural capital um, title uh, that she did a research about the participation, cultural part participation of uh, youth. Then Maaike van Leendert from Radboud University, Nijmegen in the Netherlands, will talk about the donation question in literature literary literature initiatives so um the question of donation and and uh Messines in uh, the cultural sector is very actual very relevant also and she looked at the motivations of uh donations uh, donators uh and why they donate money to uh literature and then finally alice de matos Guimaras, um, she's uh, actually um, teaching eh, or linked to the university in uh, the Hochschule in uh, Norway, and her thesis is about the role of social circus in uh, Brazil and Latin America in the first decades of the 21st century. So uh, let's start with uh, Jenny Pekarinen from Sibelius Academy, uh, Academy in uh, Finland. And um, Laura Dore, who uh, sent also the invitation, and will do the moderation. You can um, ask your questions in two ways, or you put them in the chat, and then uh, Laura will uh, transmit it to the speakers. Or you can raise your hand. Eh? In that case, it would be nice if you also open your camera and you can ask your uh, question directly to uh, the speakers. But of course, uh, uh, Laura will uh, manage that in a very good way. Yes. So uh, let's start with uh, Jenny. Jenny, you have the floor and uh, we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. I will just uh, share my screen. Can you see my presentation now? Yes, perfect. Great. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jenny Pekkarinen. 
I'm very happy to be here today to give this presentation. I would uh, first of all like to thank the University of Antwerp and the Fund for Cultural Management, especially Professor Anik Schramme and Laura Dore for the invitation and for organizing this event. So I will now uh, present an article which I have written based on my master's thesis. First, a very, very brief introduction of myself. Uh, my background is in cultural production and art management. I gained my master's degree in art management at the Sibelius Academy, which is part of the University of the Arts Helsinki in Finland. I am now doing my PhD in cultural policy at the University of Jyväskylä. And in my dissertation, I study international capital of culture programs from a cultural sustainability point of view. And currently, I also work as a project planner at the University of the Arts Helsinki. So my master's thesis was titled Fostering Cultural Participation to Address Youth Disillusionment in the Context of the European Capital of Culture, the Case of Oulu 2026. Oulu 2026 refers to the European Capital of Culture project of the city of Oulu and its surrounding region. My supervisors were Violeta Simianovska, the head of the Arch Management Department at the Sibelius Academy, and Franco Bianchini, who at the time was our visiting professor. So the article uh, which I will now present is based on my master's thesis. It has been accepted for publication in the Nordic Journal of Cultural Policy, and it will be out next month. In this paper, I ask, how do the participatory measures in the bidding phase of all 2026 respond to the youth disillusionment and cultural participation related needs and challenges among young adults in the region, especially among those experiencing marginalization or disadvantage? I also wanted to address the question of how the ECOC criteria and guidelines guide bidding cities in ensuring equal participation opportunities and the inclusion of marginalized and disadvantaged communities. I also want to point out that the study focuses on the bidding phase activities and bid book of all 2026 and later developments in the project have not been considered. So um, first, a bit of background information. Um, the official European Capital of Culture or ECOC criteria highlight the importance of promoting social inclusion and equal participation opportunities for a wide range of citizens, uh, paying special attention to young people and marginalized and disadvantaged groups, and involving the local population and civil society in the preparation of the application and implementation of the program. The term youth disillusionment is a term used in the Global Risks Report by the World Economic Forum to refer to the experience of disappointment anger and betrayal among young people worldwide. As a consequence of crises like the financial crisis, COVID-19, climate emergency, rising inequality, and the technology-driven industrial transformation, young people globally are facing weakened educational, economic, and job prospects, as well as increasing mental health issues. Youth disillusionment is mentioned as a major neglected risk that will turn into a critical risk globally in the near future. The causes and levels of youth disillusionment vary in different parts of the world. In the Finnish context, a study by UNICEF in 2021 found that one in three Finnish youths felt that it was not easy to dream of a good future. In a youth barometer study in 2020, young people's quality of life estimations were lower than ever before in the barometer's history. Mental health issues among young people are growing, uh, loneliness is increasing, and younger generations have also been among the most affected by COVID-19. Recent studies in the Finnish context show that young people from gender and sexual minorities of foreign backgrounds and with disabilities are more likely than their peers to feel discontent, lonely and, dis and exhausted, have mental health problems and experience discrimination or harassment. The city of Oulu is located about 600 kilometers north of Helsinki. The Oulu 2026 area stretches from the west coast all the way to the eastern border with Russia. The region consisting of the city of Oulu and 39 other cities and municipalities is home to over 500,000 people 
and the city of Oulu, Finland's fifth biggest city, has a population of over 200,000. The population is currently uh, relatively young, but the population is, is aging fast, both in Oulu and in the whole region. Youth unemployment is high, and problems of mental health and loneliness are increasing in this region too. Many young adults leave after graduation for better opportunities in the south of Finland or abroad. Social and political contrasts are stronger than in southern parts of the country. There, there is also a strong presence of religious communities, some of whom have uh, stricter boundaries regarding cultural participation, for example. Rather than a cultural city, Oulu is known as a tech hub, although there are many cultural institutions and, cult and annual cultural events in the region. The bidding phase of Oulu's ECOC project started in 2017. The aim since the beginning was to enable different ways and levels of participation, from very low threshold opportunities to more active co-creation or volunteering, for example. The role of children and young people was seen as central. In the early stages, a series of workshops were held with elementary uh, school children to learn about their hopes and dreams for future Oulu. The project team uh, organized visits to everyday places like shopping malls, libraries and schools to discuss with different kinds of people in their daily environments. They also organized meetings with different actors and equality workshops with different communities, including ethnic minorities, LGBTQ plus people and people with disabilities. They also commissioned a survey from the cultural policy research Kupore to gain a better understanding of people's perceptions of Oulu and their cultural participation habits and barriers. The main way of involving the local population in the program planning was through open calls in which anyone could participate with their own ideas. The idea here was that the most active ones would benefit the most. Another participation of the opportunity was a communications-based cultural ambassadors program, the idea of which was that cultural ambassadors would get information of the project, uh, be invited to trainings and events, and they could then work as messengers of the Oulu 2026 project in their own communities. The final stages of the bidding phase were affected by COVID-19, which led to some live events and meetings being cancelled. And then in June 2021, Oulu was designated as the next Finnish European capital of culture. In the research, I utilized both qualitative and quantitative methods. The data consisted of a survey among young adults aged 18 to 24 in the region, and it gathered uh, 192 responses from 24 municipalities. Uh, I also did a document review of the bid book of Oulu 2021. To analyze the survey data, I used cross tabulation to identify differences between three groups. Those young adults who did not experience marginalization or disadvantage, those young adults who did experience marginalization or disadvantage, and those uh, who experienced marginalization or disadvantage uh, based on two or more intersecting categories of difference. I also compare, compared groups two and three with the overall group of young adults. I visualized the results in the form of figures, and I then conducted statistical tests to determine the statistical significance of differences. And to analyze the bitbook material, I used the content analysis method. The paper contributes to and draws from academic discussion on cultural participation, cultural citizenship, and intersectionality. I wanted to not predetermine what culture or cultural participation mean, but to let the respondents define what they mean for them. I consider different forms of cultural participation from so-called passive and active forms of participation to questions of inclusion and influencing. I try to avoid the notion of non-participation because that already includes an idea of what cultural participation is or what it should be. For example, Janowicz and Stevenson argue that the non-participation discourse suppresses many voices and maintains existing top-down power relations in cultural policy. Cultural citizenship then refers to an understanding of citizenship, which is not just a legal or formal question, but a social and cultural construct. It is about cultural rights and participation opportunities, but also essentially about cultural norms and assumptions, representations and structures, questions of inclusion and belonging, 
and people's own experience of their citizenry. According to Renato Rosaldo, cultural citizenship is about the right to be different and to belong in a participatory democratic sense. I approached the topic through an intersectional lens to understand young adults' experiences of marginalization and disadvantage. Intersectionality especially helps to understand simultaneous experiences of different forms of discrimination. So then moving on to the findings. 19% of all respondents experienced marginalization or disadvantage, and 64% of them listed two or more factors that caused marginalization or disadvantage for them. As you see in this figure, mental and or physical health was the mo most common cause of marginalization or disadvantage, followed, followed by sexuality, gender, social or economic position or class, and then religion. The results do not show what kinds of health issues are in question, but as young people's mental health issues are a known issue in the region, it is likely that mental health issues form a significant part of this number. Regarding barriers to participation, long distances and lack of information were identified as the main barriers among all respondents. However, a comparison between groups revealed some differences respondents belonging to marginalized or disadvantaged groups faced more barriers to participation than other respondents, especially when the experience was based on two or more intersecting factors. And the speech bubbles here are quotations from the open-ended answers. So here, I hope you can see um, the purple group is group one, which includes those respondents who did not experience marginalization or disadvantage. Orange is group two, including those who did belong to marginalized or disadvantaged group or groups. And then group three, uh, the blue one, uh, that includes those who experienced uh, marginalization or disadvantage based on multiple factors. Expensive prices and lack of friends to participate with were common barriers among groups two and three. Respondents in groups two and three also named feeling excluded and lack of difference and diversity in programming as a barrier significantly more often than group one. In the open-ended answers, some respondents hope for more accessible, inclusive and low threshold activities and more cultural offering representing minority cultures. 75% of the survey respondents felt disillusioned at least sometimes. The results show a clear link between marginalization or disadvantage and experiences of disillusionment. The respondents who identified themselves as belonging to marginalized or disadvantaged groups were more likely to experience disillusion disillusionment more often. All respondents in group three experienced disillusionment at least sometimes, and almost half of them quite often or all the time. The survey distinguished between personal and general levels of disillusionment, general referring to causes related to the wider societal level and personal to one's own personal life. Those belonging to multiple marginalized or disadvantaged groups were most likely to experience disillusionment on both general and personal levels. Looking at all respondents together, the most common causes uh, on a general level were inequality in society, discrimination of different demographic or social groups, and the impacts of COVID-19. But looking at the three groups separately reveals some differences. Respondents in group three were more likely than other young people to name almost all of the predetermined factors as causes of disillusionment. All these factors here marked with yellow caused significantly more disillusionment for groups two and three than for group one. The difference was especially clear when comparing groups one and three. On a personal level, financial challenges or worries, lack of faith in one's possibilities to influence things, mental health problems, experiences of discrimination, feeling excluded from society, and lack of recognition or acceptance in society caused significantly more disillusionment for groups two and three than for group one. In addition, poor employment and career prospects were rated significantly higher by group three than group one. The Bid Book of Oulu 2026 includes several aims to encourage participation and a sense of belonging among a wide range of citizens. 
The outreach section of the bid book also includes mentions of marginalization and disadvantage and a diversity and equality strategy, which mentions, for example, supporting minority arts and the participation of minority groups in the pricing of events and including, for example, young people, disabled people and immigrants in the OLU 2026 advisory board. The already mentioned open calls are mentioned as a strategy to get people involved in the program planning. Besides the cultural ambassadors program, there were no volunteering opportunities in the bidding phase and also no opportunities for young people to take part in the decision making of the project. The bid book discusses some actions to specifically target young people. For example, the Urban Boost program line addresses the issue of youth, uh, youth unemployment sorry, by encouraging young people to take an active stance in building their own future and by supporting their faith in their own opportunities to make an impact. The Untamed Office project gives young, pe young, young unemployed people the opportunity to develop their skills in the cultural industry and the Voice to Taboo and Mind Blown, Mind Blown projects address mental health issues. Although the bid book discusses several matters that arise from the survey data as participation challenges, many gaps can be identified. The bid book appears to lack recognition of the diverse causes of young, pe young people's experiences of marginalization, disadvantage and disillusionment especially in the case of those experiencing intersectional marginalization or disadvantage. For example, even though the bid book discusses barriers, the barriers to participation that were the most common among all survey respondents, significant barriers among marginalized and disadvantaged groups have not been recognized. Also, marginalized and disadvantaged groups are addressed in the bid book more as targets of outreach activities and passive participants and less as agents like creators or organizers of high quality artistic program. Then to some discussion and concluding remarks. The bit of Olu appears to fulfill the ECOC criteria, but still many of the participatory needs of young adults have not been recognized. For example, the participatory strategy was largely based on the idea that the most active ones would benefit the most. I argue that such a system of open opportunities that rewards one's own activity without profoundly identifying the diverse barriers to participation among different communities will encourage the already active and motivated ones with sufficient personal resources to take part while ignoring the needs of those who face marginalization or disadvantage. Based on the findings, I claim that if Olu wants to address the issue of youth disillusionment, they should first of all address the needs and challenges of marginalized and disadvantaged communities. I suggest that an intersectional approach can be an effective tool for Olu to respond to the identified issues. I mean, for example, developing intersectional awareness across different areas of activity and at all stages of program planning and implementation. I also propose that Olu should actively aim to identify and challenge the stigmatization and marginalization of different communities in the different localities in the region to respond to the issue of youth disillusionment and to enhance cultural citizenship. One concrete measure could be enhancing the presence of diverse groups of young adults in the decision making and evaluation processes. The ECOC criteria and guidelines clearly express the need to create equal participation opportunities for a wide range of citizens, but they do not offer any more specific frameworks or methods, and that leaves a lot of room for interpretation. The lack of guidelines or frameworks for addressing the needs of marginalized groups may lead to a situation in which the needs of some groups are addressed while those of others are ignored. So to respond to the participatory expectations of the ECOC, bidding and designated cities need to be able to look beyond averages and assumptions. I suggest that integrating, an inter uh, integrating intersectionality in the ECOC criteria should be evaluated and that minority marginalized and disadvantaged groups should be included in different sections of the ECOC criteria, including cultural and artistic content and management and not just the outreach section. I believe that changes in the official criteria and guidelines are an efficient way to enhance participation and inclusion because they work as guiding principles for all ECOC cities and candidates. 
And I have my last slide. I think I'm just about done with my time, but very briefly. So uh, first of all, it should be noted that the study has some limitations. The amount of data and especially of qualitative material is uh, relatively small. The volunteer sampling method also has its limitations as it may be best in reaching the most active ones. The findings should therefore be considered as suggestive. But I believe they still provide useful insights about young people's cultural participation and citizenship, especially in the context of the ECOC. Also, the study provides a hopefully useful example of integrating an intersectional lens in a cultural participation study. The case of OLU 2026 suggests that responding to the participatory objectives of the ECOC requires cultivating intersectional awareness as well as aspirations to profoundly understand issues limiting full cultural citizenship. As a tool or a lens in research or policy making, intersectionality can help us better, better address questions of equal rights and opportunities to belonging, participation and being different in plural societies. I thus propose that contemporary cultural citizenship debates in academia and in policy should be accompanied by intersectional awareness to maintain their relevance in today's societies. And that was all then just small list of references. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yanni, for your insightful presentation. Are there any questions or thoughts from our audience? You can raise your virtual hand or pose a question through the chat. Both are very fine. Okay, I see in the chat a remark or question by Thomas de Pape. I admire the effort to put intersectionality on the agenda. Is there a political will in ULU to go further with your ideas? Was there a reaction from ULU 2026? Yeah, that's um that's a good question. Uh, they did invite me uh, to present uh, the findings uh, in in a meeting they had just like shortly after their designation. Uh, they were really interested and there were people um, asking questions uh, and they did after that, I do not know if it was uh, because of my research or if they were planning to do that otherwise anyway, but they did hire, um, what was the title? It was, um, it was something like uh, inclusion and diversity coordinator or, or, or something like that. Uh, so, so they did something, but um, I haven't heard any news of them actually like trying to integrate the kind of intersectional lens at their different like stages of operations, unfortunately. I see that Helleke van den Braber has raised her hand. Okay. Uh, yes, can I just pose my question? Yeah, like that? okay. Right. Well, thank you, uh, Jenny, for your presentation. Well, I wondered what was for you the most unexpected result of your work, also maybe in view of the theoretical framework you employed? Yeah, hmm. that's a very good question. I think I think I was um, I was maybe surprised um, that really the differences between the groups were so clear. Also, like after really applying the statistical tests, uh, that it really showed a statistically significant difference and that there was really a clear difference also between the groups two and three. So like the kind of multiple experience of marginalization or disadvantage based on multiple factors uh, caused really a, a clear difference in the, in the results. Um, yeah, I think maybe, maybe that was, uh, even, even though it was somehow expected, I, maybe it was still a little bit uh, surprising how how clear that was. Uh, also, like um, now I just presented kind of part of the material that I used for the article, but I had a lot of like open ended answers in the in the survey as well, which was really insightful and it really showed. Well, maybe it's also partly because of the kinds of, like I said, like that this volunteer sampling method may be uh, very useful for reaching the people who are already active and thinking about that. But like it really showed that there were lots of young people who had really profoundly thought about matters uh, regarding, for example, 
uh, well, a discrimination or diversity issues. Um, yeah, so maybe at least those couple of things. Yes, thank you. Okay, are there any more questions or thoughts or comments? Okay, if not, we're about to move on to our second speaker of the evening. So please direct your attention to Maaike van Leenders of the Radboud University in Nijmegen. And we will now delve into the world of literary initiatives. Maaike, we are eager to hear your insights on the complexities behind giving questions in the context of the early COVID-19 period. So whenever you are ready, Maaike, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Laura. I will also start sharing my screen. Um, is it visible? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, my name is Michael van Leenert. I graduated in 2021 from Radboud University. I'm currently working there as a lecturer. Uh, and I'm very glad I got the opportunity to present my master thesis here. Um, so um, as lovers of arts and culture, it will not have escaped your notice that culture suffered a lot during the COVID years. Institutions as well as individual artists were hit hard. And to cushion those blows, they came up with all kinds of inventive solutions. Uh, and they did things that they might not have done or dared to do otherwise. For example, they asked uh, their audience for a donation, like this artist did. He made his text available for free via the internet um, and hoped for the goodwill of his audience to support him financially. But why would an artist ask or not ask such a question? And what does it mean for your self-image and your vision of your artistry if you knock on your reader's door for help? And those questions were central in my master thesis. And in this thesis, I focus on the literary sector. And on the one hand, this decision narrows down my research a lot because it excludes theater, visual arts, and all other kinds uh, of art forms. But at the same time, it gave me the opportunity to focus on one specific kind of artist and thus come to conclusions that can be interesting far beyond the literary sector. Because the writer is like an individualist working from their attic, and it makes them significantly different from someone who is part of a theater company, but not actually that different from a singer-songwriter or a sculptor. Because after all, these are all working individually. It's the artist versus the culture lover, the writer versus the reader. And sometimes such an artist has an agent or a publisher who mediates, or sometimes there's a cultural fund that stands in between the inquiring artist and the donating literature lover. But in my research, I did not focus on them, but on the lone wolves in the sector um, who made direct contact with their potential givers, or in this case, their readers. So they posted their questions on Instagram or Facebook, or they um, put a donation link on their website or they even ask their questions through WhatsApp. So in short, these are the asking artists who are normally very much underexposed precisely because they act so alone. And asking a question to the audience changes the relationship between the reader and writer, which is generally fairly distant. Because writers asking for support are asking something different from, please read my book. And that is quite scary and it raises all kinds of tensions and dilemmas. And of the writers I interviewed for my thesis, several chose to ask for uh, a question to the readers, um, despite all of these tensions and dilemmas. But other writers did not, and they too were included in the study because just as it is interesting to understand what the askers are up against, it's also very relevant to know what is stopping writers from asking. So I interviewed six of them, uh, three askers and three non-askers. And all of this led to the following research question. Which arguments do artists and platforms within the Dutch literary sector use within the first three months of the COVID-19 pandemic when they do or do not ask for a monetary gift? 
So in other words, why do the askers ask and why don't the non-askers ask? Uh, and in the remaining 15 or so minutes, uh, I'd like to take you through the results of my thesis. But first we need to ask, uh, we need to talk about what asking actually means, because it's not simply uh, asking people to buy your work um, and pay for it, but asking for a gift. So in other words, a donation through so-called patronage. And although there are all kinds of different forms of patronage, it actually always works according to the same basic dynamic as outlined by Van der Braber. And it looks like this. So there's an artist, the writer in this case, versus a patron, the reader. And between them stands that which the uh, one writes and that which the other one wants to make possible. So a book, a poem, whatever kind of artwork. And in this case, writers are the askers and therefore they have all kinds of things to receive, but they can return a lot as well. They can return their work, um, but perhaps also other things such as giving the patron access to their network or uh, by giving them a chance to see up close what the writing process is actually like. Reciprocity is therefore also a very important concept within patronage. Uh, but the tricky thing about this is that the asking artist often has no idea what their donator is, um, does actually want, uh, and that makes the position of the asker very uncertain. But why is it interesting to study patronage uh, in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic? Because after all, uh, patronage um, existed long before the pandemic flattened out the cultural sector, but it became especially relevant when this was the case. Because during this period, a lot of income from the market fell away. Um, although writers could basically continue to work as usual, because writers can work anywhere, anytime, um, they could no longer visit schools, reside in libraries, or boost their book sales with a performance at a festival. And moreover, uh, readers found it difficult to actually find their way to the bookstores. So the income from the market yeah. declined sharply. And when this happens, you have two options. One, you knock on the government's door for emergency aid and fingers crossed that you actually get it. Or two, you take matters into your own hands and you start asking your friends, your admirers, anyone who cares about you and your work. And when I put it this way, the choice might seem pretty simple. You go ask. COVID therefore functioned as a booster for considering patronage. But asking was not a logical option for everyone. Uh, and the writers who did choose to ask uh, faced a variety of obstacles and doubts that I'd like to discuss with you. And these obstacles and doubts are often based on certain fixed ideas uh, about what being a writer should entail. And I will now list seven of these uh, assumptions and then list three more positive ones about patronage. The first one, um, I do not actually need support enough or someone else needs to support more than I do. Because is it fair to ask for a donation when your bank account is not completely empty yet? And what about if you still have a part-time job in addition to being a writer? Is it fair to enter a patronage relationship then? Uh, there are always people who seem to need a donation more than you do, and this caused some guilt among the writers who were interviewed. The second, asking makes me pushy or a beggar, and if I ask one more time, I'm perceived as a stalker. Because doesn't asking just uh, imply just submissively holding up your hand? And what if people feel like they have to say yes to your question? The latter was an important question of a poet who sought donations mainly in her immediate surroundings uh, and was afraid of offending her friends and acquaintances. But the idea that as an asker you come across as a beggar was very much present among, among both the askers and the non-askers. And earlier in this presentation, we saw that patronage relationships are uh, reciprocal uh, and thus the asker also gives something in return rather than just receives, but many authors still had the fear of overcharging their givers. And that also leads us to the next assumption. What do you actually give in return and does your patron accept that and want that? Uh, one author with which uh, this was very much in play was a writer who for technical reasons did not have enough information to really um, thank their givers. Um, 
and he could also not ask them if the project was ultimately going into the direction they envisioned when they uh, actually gave him their donation. Um, so asking therefore didn't feel like this reciprocal uh, relationship because of this and then the feeling of being a beggar quite easily comes into play. Asking can also cause image damage. Um, if you apply for a grant from a fund and this application does not get awarded, no one actually needs to know about it. And if you do get the grant, it means that the committee thought you were good enough. So in other words, you are ascribed value. However, asking for support is often not so concealed. In fact, you may have to talk to many people about your request before you are actually successful. And if you put your request on the internet, like these artists did, it is immediately visible for everyone. And that's quite vulnerable. People can see that your current income isn't enough and may have an opinion about that. Consider, for example, best-selling authors who ask for a donation. Are they really that successful if they don't have enough income from book sales? Then money is filthy. The whole world seems to think that artists just should do everything for free and writers are no exception to that. And with such an expectation, it can sometimes be quite scary for an artist to tell you that they actually do want to get paid for their work. And of course, the same goes for patronage. And on top of that, asking for a donation does not happen very often and also happens very little openly, making the stigma even bigger than on money in general. This assumption is, addresses the question, who should actually pay for the arts? And who is allowed to assign value to your work? Not all of the writers interviewed felt that this role lies with the audience. For example, it should be the role of a magazine that invited them to contribute. And here again, we see the difference between grants and patronage. Uh, some writers indicated that they felt more comfortable with grant funding because then a professional committee and not some random individual I decided on the quality of the work and thus also on the appropriateness of the request, whereas this was not the case, uh, case with patronage. Uh, then asking affects my autonomy. Uh, what was striking in my research was that the writers interviewed were not afraid of losing their autonomy because of their request. And this was probably because these writers did not enter into long-term patronage relationships. Or, for example, because they did not ask until their work was already finished and published. So a patron could no longer uh, change much about the content anyways. However, all writers could imagine that the readers could sometimes interfere with the creative process and thus affect their autonomy. Some of the artists mentioned that things just uh, such as being represented by a publisher or receiving a commission um, are not necessarily a problem for them as long as they could continue to make their own choices, which would also be important when they would enter a patronage relationship. Um, luckily, there were uh, all kinds of other assumptions as well, which were uh, um, more positive and contributed to people's will to ask, and I will now list three of them. And the first one is again about autonomy, because in fact, asking can also increase someone's autonomy. It takes the artist out of a passive position of waiting to see whether or not a grant application will be awarded because they can actively uh, ask and promote their request themselves. And moreover, uh, asking during COVID made um, them way less dependent on the ever-changing rules of the Dutch government, and they were indeed ever-changing. Uh, asking also shows that creating art actually costs money and time. One of the artists in his study set up a platform during the COVID-19 crisis, and for this platform, she invited other writers to contribute by submitting a story. And she, like many others, was convinced that writers should actually be paid, but the platform itself had no money at all, so how do you do that? And putting a donation link below a story was therefore the perfect solution for them. And apart from this, there was a general page on the website that explained the importance of actually paying artists. And the last one, there is a psychological dimension as well. 
because asking for a donation is sometimes also simply asking for help. Artists who saw their income evaporate during the COVID crisis sometimes felt abandoned by the government and its measures. And how beautiful and helpful is it then to have a group of patrons, anonymous or not, uh, around you who do not only support you financially, but also legitimize and give recognition to you and your work with their donations. And even in a post-COVID world, uh, this support can motivate artists and provide validation. Moreover, artists can proudly present their patrons to the outside world, showing that their work is actually supported. As early as 2010, uh, the former Dutch State Secretary Halbe Zelska called for a culture of giving and a culture of asking in the Netherlands. Because if we want citizens to give more, uh, artists must also ask more, more actively and more effectively. And in recent years, this has been slow to materialize. And although the COVID crisis has persuaded some artists to start their asking journey, there are still many doubts, uncertainties and assumptions about asking for a gift. So merely cutting subsidies, which is what Selska is known for in the Netherlands, is not enough to bring such a culture of asking to life. Nor is a global crisis in which many artists can hardly work, if at all. So if we want patrons to flourish in a post-COVID world, we should actually do something about it. And I believe this can be done in several ways. First, we need a change in mindset. We need to get rid of the idea that money is actually filthy also when it comes to giving and asking. The realization that making yourselves rely on your readers um, and entering into a reciprocal relationship with them is not a bad thing, it's not a shame, and it does not undermine your authenticity and uh, autonomy is not so very present in the cultural sector right now, but it can become present if we promote it together as policymakers, grant makers, cultural institutions, students and researchers, we can let all those potential askers uh, know that asking is actually quite accepted and legitimized and that they may do so with their heads held high. And in addition, there are some practical things that we can contribute to as well. So the artist I research is largely invented to wheel themselves. They did not use intermediary agencies or platforms, but even to the artists um, who want to approach the readers themselves, knowledge should be accessible and we can share this knowledge uh, for example on a platform or just by telling our students telling our friends and tell artists about it this was my presentation thank you very much for listening and uh, i now open the floor to questions thank you mike for your interesting and valuable insights so if there are any questions or reflections from our audience feel free to ask Well, maybe I have a question myself, Maike. Um, yes. Considering the unique challenges posed by the pandemic, were there to you any specific literary initiatives that really stood out for you in overcoming these obstacles that you posed? Um, well, I think that all of the initiatives I researched were very inspiring. Um, but if I need to choose one, I think the one... Um, with the different stories that were submitted uh, with the donation links. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was a really great way of overcoming certain challenges that were uh, COVID specific, um, but also just really showing that um, writing is actually work and that you should pay people. And uh, they made that visible in a very low key way, but also very direct and uh, clearly visible way. So I really liked it, yeah. yeah. Okay, I see here a question from Lydia van Dam. I wonder whether the writers continued after COVID to ask for donations. Well, I I am checking that now <laughs> sometimes, and they didn't. Although um, one of them said in the interviews that he was so inspired by this and he really wanted to continue. Um, 
I didn't really see him doing it again. So I think uh, they also said that when the need for the donations um, was missing a bit because they got like government funding or they could work again, um, they started to promote their questions a little bit less. So I think um, they have other work again and other uh, income. But this is an interesting question, yeah. But I see a question from uh, Annick who says, do you think the role of donations in the literature sector is different from other art sectors? Mm, yes, in the sense that there are a lot of um, people who are really working individually. So that's very different from like donations to institutions. Although there are some of the mechanisms are the same. Um, so in that sense, yes. Um, and also in specifically in the COVID sense, um, I think what was very different here was that people assumed that writers could just continue to write their books and could continue to get their money. Well, a lot of their income actually comes from performing at festivals and really promoting their work uh, and not very much from book sales. So um, I think that was very different from other art forms. Yeah. I see that Yeni also has a question. Yeah, thanks, Mike. A very interesting uh, presentation. So I wanted to ask, um, ask you a little bit about um, uh, the people you interviewed, did you notice anything? Was there what, did, what kind of a role did peer pressure uh, play in the kind of people's perceptions and ideas of asking for money? I'm, I'm asking because, for example, with the COVID-19 grants in Finland, there was a lot of discussion. Um, for example, some very successful artists uh, applied for public grants mm. and they actually received it. And there was a lot of discussion about who actually like should get these funds when we are kind of in this state of emergency. And then it's actually given to people who don't necessarily need it. And also at work now, uh, we are studying uh, art-based entrepreneurs values and a lot of them when we ask about them about kind of their motivations or their the role of monetary value and a lot of them somehow refer to their uh, artist cycles and how money is kind of seen there so they kind of reflect everything that they do based on how it's seen and how it's judged uh, yeah in that circle so so did you notice anything like that yeah, yeah, this sounds very familiar, actually, from the interviews. Um, um, I think I didn't even really ask much about just the general role of money, but everyone just started talking about, um, you know, people think we should do everything for free, and um, it's so uh, hard to just ask for a normal price for my work. Um, so, yeah, I really recognize that. And also, um, just a fear of, coming across as someone who begs for money and who doesn't deserve it. Um, yeah, it was very much present. And yeah, I thought it was really interesting that both the people who actually did ask for a gift uh, felt that and also the people who were like, oh my God, no, I would never do that because I don't want to be a beggar. So yes, yes, very much. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, if there are no other comments or questions. So our final speaker of the evening is Alice De Matos Guimeres from the Western Norway University of Applied Sciences, but currently in Australia. And Alice, we would like to hear your insights into the ordinary city as a stage for culture, creativity, and social inclusion. So you can take the lead now if you're ready. Yes, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, I'll share my presentation here. So yeah, hello everyone. Um, yeah, as mentioned, I'm in Australia, so quite late for me. So please bear with me. I hope I can make it work. But thank you, Yanni, and thank you, Mikey, for the very inspiring presentations before. And many thanks to the University of Antwerp for the, the opportunity of being here. 
So, yeah, a little bit about myself. I am Alice de Matos Guimarães, originally from Brazil, uh, but currently uh, in Norway as a PhD candidate uh, looking at crowdfunding for the culture and creative industries. But this work that I'm talking here today was my master thesis that I did as part of the Erasmus Mundus joint master degree between Glasgow, Barcelona and Rotterdam. So you see some references to Rotterdam. Um, actually, no. So I would like to start the presentation pinpointing the matter of inequality and social unevenness. Um, Latin America is the region with the highest inequalities rate in the world. And I believe that the pictures uh, talk by themselves, I speak by themselves, sorry, uh, because what is considered a poor neighborhood in uh, Rotterdam, uh, Charlois, uh, you can see structurally speaking, is quite better off than the the neighborhood that is considered a uh, low middle class in the city of Pechin. Pechin is a city in southeast Brazil. Uh, it's part of the metropolitan region of the city of Belo Horizonte, with the capital of uh, Minas Gerais state. And it is a city, is, and this street is where Edson lives. And Edson was one of the interviews in my research, and I would like to let him speak first. So I hope you can hear. I hope I share the audio. Olá, meu nome é Edson can you hear? Eu tenho 17 anos e sou aluno de Circo Todo Mundo. No final de 2016, eh, eu estava passando na rua e uma das diretoras me chamou para conversar e explicar um pouco sobre o circo para mim. E eu lá em casa pensando, sentado, falei, eu sei que esse é um lugar onde que eu vou ficar e eu quero ficar para o resto da minha vida. E eu já estou aqui há quatro anos. Onde a minha avó mora é um lugar conhecido mais como favela. E se tivesse um, este, os meninos de lá tivesse essa oportunidade de ter uma ONG assim lá, porque lá a única coisa que acontece é a maioria dos jovens e adolescentes é entrar no mundo das drogas, nas coisas erradas. Eu penso, se tivesse um outro circo lá para eles, muito desses meninos não entrariam nesse mundo, porque no início a gente cria um amor, uma paixão de querer descobrir tudo, esse mundo fantástico que é o circo. I hope through my presentation, I will make you understand more about this fantastic world of the circus. Um, here is an outline of what I'm talking today. Uh, this is Edson again doing some malabaris. So I'll be going through the motivation behind my research hypothesis and objectives, uh, research question, and so on and so forth. So to start with i believe that it's very important to have in mind that the picture behind this this study is the contemporary globalized urbanized reality and in latin america which again is the highest inequality rates in the world and also the highest rates of urbanization and of course urbanization this fast speed urbanization that latin america had is very much connected to the rates of social inequality and this inequality is historical, is a structure, is part of a culture of privileges, and remains as a permanent problem, which results in a huge lack of opportunities, especially for young people living in the marginalized areas where they have deprivation of many material means, and uh, social and symbolic as well. Uh, but uh, within the idea of the global and contemporary world, by the turn of the century, we saw the cultural creative industries becoming quite a trend into the policy debate and also academic debate to be uh, a tool for urban development policies. And in the uh, context of neoliberal discourse, which uh, Bourdieu defines as a strong discourse that is dissocialized and de dishistorialized, uh, that leaves the social well being subject to the rule of fairness related to a certain economic hierarchy, what we saw is that the 
the CTI's policies, they could have a very negative impact of social, on social inequality, especially when displacing residents from certain areas, creating gentrification, and so on and so forth. I think many of you are aware of this discussion to some extent. Um, however, we know that culture and arts has a transformative power. We, we know that they can have an impact in the social and economic life of people and society in general. And that's why I chose the social circus as my case study, because I believe it is a creative and innovative fusion between a performance art and a social intervention. So my main hypothesis was that in places of material deprivation and social exclusion, the social circus can offer opportunities to overcome ill-fated odds. And my objectives were to search for reconceptualization of CCIs, somehow they were externalizing the field in an effort of stretching this concept away from the neoliberal policy prescription and getting it closer to this idea of social right. And of course, perceiving the I, this discussion of an ordinary city as the most suitable stage to receive the artistic practice that can enhance opportunities and also dreams. Um, so as my main research question, I had the idea of why and how does the social circus practice represent a uh, resignification of cultural creative economy into the right to the ordinary cities in the Latin America context. And uh, what basically means that I was looking into how, uh, why the social circus is both a creative industry, but also a social inclusive urban policy. And I divided my study in three categories. First, the urban studies, in which I look um, how is the social circus linked to the urban context and how it can foster the experience of the right to the ordinary cities. And uh, within the cultural creative economy, I try to understand why does the social circus practice represent this new concept of CCIs and uh, a social right at the same time in, in Latin America. And of course, with the idea of the social circus field, uh, because it is a field in itself, uh, why is the social circus being a tool for social transformation? And what are the opportunities and challenges to measure its impact? Because as you can, you will see, I had a lot of issues with how to grasp the, the, the real impact in numbers and representativeness. Um, so going further on my methodological point of view, I did this master thesis back in 2020. So I was going to field when COVID hit. So I had really to adapt what I was supposed to do first. Uh, in terms of the literature review, of course, I was safe and I did this post-colonial effort and epistemologies from the South, uh, meaning that I really tried to understand what the, the scholars from the region were talking about more than actually just looking the the main cultural economists to understand what would be uh, translated in other territories. I, I did a quantitative analysis of the whole context of Latin America and the like creative artistic market, informality, how it works, uh, but I'm not going to enter this here. I'm going to be focused on my qualitative approach in which I did uh, interviews, semi-structured interviews and oral history. So this is like, the adapted design, because it is very important to, to remember about social inequality when we have this idea that everyone went uh, online when pandemic hit is definitely not true. Many, many of my interviews didn't have the resources or the means to do so. So it was hard to even have a Zoom uh, call with them. I interview with, they didn't have computers and so what happened is that I contacted scholars and people from Cirque du Soleil uh, 
that they have the project of Cirque du Monde, which is one of the main uh, projects in social circus. And um, they send me people that send other people. So I did this, this snowball techniques. And what happened that I incorporate horror history because people couldn't have the interview with me online in any uh, kind of software, whatever, but they do use WhatsApp a lot. So people in the social circus, they start sending me pictures and sending a lot of voice notes. So it was not a proper interview, but I had so many like tales of how the circus integrate their life that I had to, to put this on my research as well. So I did this, um, yeah, understanding a bit what is our history in uh, research. So um, to give an idea very like in an abstract terms of what, how I perceive my theoretical framework. Uh, as I said before, I had these three main uh, fields of study, urban studies, cultural economics, and uh, the social circus itself. But uh, the, I was working with this idea of an uneven urban development and uh, with systemic asymmetries in the so-called global north, global south, in terms of theories especially. And uh, I decided that I would need to look into other urban imaginaries. And that's when I found the concept of ordinary city by the South African scholar Jen Jennifer Hobson. And I decided to use her concept together with uh, Celso Furtado, who is a scholar from Brazil, an economist from Brazil. And since the 60s and the 70s, uh, Celso Furtado say that uh, cultural and creativity should be at the core of development processes. That development is not a accumulation of capital, but an accumulation of culture and creativity. And that uh, cultural policies are simply a depth of the social ones. So my idea was to get this order urban or imaginary with this idea of the core of culture and make it into social rights. And then it's about how people experience the city as well. And that's why I bring the Lefebvrean idea of the right to the city. And in this case, the right to the ordinary city, uh, because in Lefebvre's work, you can also see the culture in this nuance of social emancipation. So how people use culture to the sense of belonging to occupying the territory and to emancipate, like going more abstract. So going back to a more concrete and the empirical part, the spotlight and the social circus, uh, the idea of the importance of the urban here is also because the circus has arrived in the city. So from the very beginning of the history of circus, it's been in urban agglomerations. But I will jump straight to the, the, the arising of the social circus, which was together with the new stream of circus uh, around the 70s and the 80s. And since then, the, the practice of social circus grew like uh, significantly. And this mapping was made in 2014 by Cirque du Monde. And this is the, the amount of schools or organizations that we have globally. Uh, we have 21% in Latin America, and most of them are in Brazil. And the region with most initiatives is Europe with 36%. So going to my findings now, uh, I did this very simple word cloud to just start a bit on, yeah, to map where people found the, the circus, the social circus. So you see a lot of words like protagonism of people taking interest in of their life and the idea of, yeah, how is connected to, to inclusion, diversity and and new ideas of life, dreams. And of course, I have to mention here that I don't have representativeness. So all these results are with this very simple, small sample, but I do believe that this research can be expanded. And I really hope that is going to be at some point, um, not for now, but anyways. And, I will try to give within this, this 
um, bigger picture of more holistic idea of the circus. So back to the idea of the ordinary city, uh, what we saw in the social circus is a lot of similar characteristics, uh, which comes with different words such as diversity, intersectionality, no discrimination, and also the different organizations that I interview, they work with so many different marginalized groups such as LGBTQ plus communities, immigrants, and but most of them is considered at risk youth. And the organizations, they vary so much about the level of formality and the work agreements. And again, we have to remember that Latin America is also one of the highest rates of informality in the economy. And when it comes to culture and social organization, these numbers are very high. So we don't have formal work agreements. Uh, when you talk to the organizations, one person is making all the roles of the the structure of the management and the, the moms of the circus, as the interviews call, which means the moms of the participants, they also work. They will be there, men, men like doing admin work or just selling food or whatever. Uh, so there is this whole idea of how is about solidarity and cooperation, which is also connected to the idea of ordinary city. Ordinary city is based on a network of solidarity and how people navigate together the urban territory. And uh, more about the participants, it's again, very hard to say all the really impact, but what we saw is that all the participants in the social circus despite where they were from and the marginalized areas, they finished high school, which is very different from the, their parents. So most of them had completely high school and their parents barely finished elementary school. So we can see, of course, there is the whole context of Latin America and the pink tide process and how social improvements were happening, but having something that gave them, in their words, hope and dreams, and one of my interviews, she told me that she wanted to go for a law degree because she learned about the culture of rights doing circus. So it was quite poetic how the circus opened up the idea of justice for her and opportunities again. And uh, they also, when you look at the cultural economy literature, you see this profile of cultural consumer, which are higher educated, usually high income. Uh, but when people start experience culture and like the participants in the circus, they start going and seeking for culture. So they increase their cultural consumption. So there is this notion of maybe you need exposure to be a cultural consumption. It's not only about income and education. There is something more. There is some something about the community, the sense of belonging, the identity, that is those symbolic dimensions and intangible dimensions that is not captured by numbers. And uh, about uh, more the organizations that uh, replied to, to, yeah, or did the interview with me, most of them were the, the project idealizers themselves, and they had this role of the director and creating all the festivals. And uh, of course, I asked them about uh, how they fund themselves, and most of them is through donation, but they also apply for public funding, although they have a really high rate of negative responses. And um, one of my interviews, she became uh, a social circus instructor herself. And she told me that um, she had suffered abuses during her whole childhood and it was the social circus who saved her. So she believed that the only thing that she could have, uh, she could be in her life was a social circus instructor because she would like to save people as this, the circus saved her, so she never left uh, like the favela where she's from. She stayed there to save more kids. And then coming to the concluding, I will kind of go back to my sub questions within urban studies. What I got is that I do comprehend the ordinary city as the most suitable 
stage for receiving this idea of the social circus because they are indeed like they claim for diversity they claim that each city is specific is contextualized and also they foster their own creativity so for instance in the pictures of uh, the social circus i don't know if you could uh, notice but uh, one of them is in brazil and the kids are doing capoeira and then if you go to to the Argentinian ones, you have people doing tango. So they, they really incorporate the local culture in the social circus because circus itself is like an art that is very multidisciplinary. It has theater, it has dance, it has like everything, music and all the techniques and like the acrobatics as well. So it really is very adaptable. And then going to and of course there is the whole idea of inclusion and um, solidarity as i mentioned before and i i believe that the social circus can help make uh, this uneven context a more socially creative context where social inclusion is fostered and i will quote one of my interviews roberta she told me that there is um, the circus is where we can dream with our eyes open in places where usually dreams do not exist. So I, I think that this is a very powerful quote because it is about this idea of like the circus is this magic creative industry that has all the glamour of a creative industry. But when it comes to places like that, it does become a social right and transform people's life. And then again, back to the pandemic time, all the discussions was going on about the pandemic, the transformation. So I, as a optimist person and very yeah, naive sometimes maybe, but anyways, I do prefer to, to believe that it has been a moment of transformation and hopefully we're going through a moment of transformation. And uh, I'm here using Charlie's Laundry ideas that uh, every transformation is a cultural project after war afterwards and um, I think that the aim here with a work that was not representativeness we don't need to like look how to measure but rather to understand the the problem of not valuing art and culture and creativity so how can we you start thinking that it is a very valuable thing in so many aspects and change so many people's life, especially in context of, of lack of opportunities. So I hope that the message here is like, yeah, culture and creativity can transform and numbers are not enough to show what some people experience when they have the opportunity of living culture in, in their daily life. So thank you very much. That was it. And yeah, my mail is there and I'm looking forward for questions. Thank you, Alice, for your inspiring presentation. Yes, indeed, if, if our audience uh, should have any questions or comments that they would like to share. Yeah, I see Micah. Yes, thank you for your very uh, inspiring presentation. Um, I was wondering, you were telling about uh, that you got in touch through WhatsApp. Are you still in touch with these people and maybe also for further research or how is that going? Yes, I'm I still in touch with them. Oh, um, yeah, especially with the school where Edson, uh, he's now an instructor there. Uh, he graduated and uh, yeah, they, they are struggling a lot the pandemic was really mm -hmm. harsh for them but donations and yeah they came together some initiatives they help each other and the network works very well uh Cirque du Monde also helped the rest but Cirque du Soleil also had a terrible time during pandemic so for the social project it was even harder uh at true whatsapp I still have contacts with some of the other people I've been doing some like, yeah, just meetings with the schools and like some lives that they did during the pandemic. 
So in 2021, I think we had a live every month to talk with different people. And then they, uh, there are a couple of artists in, at Cirque du Soleil or, or the big companies that came from those uh, projects. So they also joined to like talk about future perspectives and other stuff. It was really nice. And yeah, I think that's nice to hear. Thanks. Yeah. And can you see an evolution after the pandemic? Um, um well, in the yeah, uh, in the political scene, yes, uh, Latin America in general had a very especially Brazil, it was very harsh, politically speaking. Our culture ministry was cancelled and our social yeah, policy, policies were terrible as well. So there is a turn in the policy, which makes me hopeful now. So I think we're getting more support. Uh, but yeah, it was a very, very hard time. And it's, it's going to take a while to like mm -hmm. get back on their mm -hmm. food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yanni, you can pose your question. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Alice. I agree with the others. A very inspiring presentation and a very important research topic as well. Um, so yeah, kind of at the end, you kind of post this question and also your suggestion on on um, somehow valuing the importance of arts and the kind of cost cost of like not valuing it um so um so i wanted to ask do you have like some ideas because i think often when we talk about measuring the impact we often talk about quantitative measures and of course they are very important as well that we measure that but somehow if we only measure quanti quantitative things it somehow restricts the whole very wide discussion in like kind of some some measures that can't really grasp the really wide transformative power that you described so do you have some suggestions like uh how could we develop some more maybe uh qualitative measures to complement the quantitative ones or or what kind of lobbying should we do to kind of get that message through do you have some ideas yeah that's a very good question i think in the case of these organizations of course is is a matter of organizing i think it would be amazing to have like a, a a panel analysis so like really following all the students in a timeline and i think if we had this like and i don't know every region within i don't know some small sample of some students but you follow the transformation and you ask about like how they're doing school how they are doing with parents relations how are they are doing with like friendships how they are doing with like going to different venues in the city and if you have this over the years i do believe that we could build a beautiful panel with like different data of like how the kids move when we ha they have this uh in their life but it's, I mean, these organizations are struggling so much already just to to be there for them to give the courses. Imagine to ask them to do like questionnaires and like to. <laughs> so it is it is a challenge. Yeah, thanks. Very uh, yeah, good idea and great point. And yeah, I think also often like in yeah, at the policy level, uh, what uh, what is often looked at are like short term things and very things that you can measure now. And maybe we would need to look at the long term things a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I see that Zoe uh, also raised her hand. Yes. Um, hello. Uh, it's more of a general question for all three of you. Uh, since we are about to write our thesis, um, do you have some general tips or tricks we should take with us? Um, because it's a big task and it would be lovely to hear from some experts. Um, I think 
you always have at least one point, but probably more, where you have so much data and you really don't know what's the, the overarching theme in it. And if you even have any results, but you do, and it will become clear at some point. So trust the process, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a very good tip from Mike. I think uh, for me, I think uh, one at least very important thing for me was peer support. So uh, find colleagues, uh, other students to talk with. It's also good to like read each other's texts. Also, it's also like uh, for me, at least it's always a bit frightening to give my text to other people because you're kind of maybe afraid of the comments or you're not really certain with that yet. But it really helped me a lot. I had like a trusted colleague with whom we all the time read each other's texts and, and commented. And then sometimes maybe take a little bit of distance from what you're doing, uh, take a break and then come back to the text and you see it with fresh eyes. And then just like trust your own analysis as well. Yeah, maybe that's what comes to my mind. Yeah, I think both did a very good summary. Uh, trust the process. It's it's a main one for sure. And I would say as well, like when you were at least works for me, when you were in a flow of writing, just keep writing. Even if like you know that you have a reference, that just like type that you have to put the reference later. But just like keep writing. Don't stop because one of reference. Just go with the flow, and then you revise later with fresh eyes, and then you put the dots where it's missing. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, any more questions, comments? Okay, so I want to thank you once more, Jenny, Mike, and Alice, for sharing your valuable insights with us tonight. And that brings us to the end of this evening, in which I will direct your attention to the concluding words of Professor Schammer. Yes, thank you, Laura. Yeah, first of all, uh, I'm really impressed to hear it again. And um, what strikes me is that you are all three very engaged. Eh? So it's uh, really this social engagement also eh, that uh, is driving you to, to do your research. And uh, yeah, in particular, also the last uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, it's really nice to see how culture can contribute eh, to social cohesion and to, <laughs> to a better society. And I think it's not naive to say that, Alice. Uh, I think actually it's uh, really an argument also to put culture also on uh, <clears throat> the next SDGs of uh, UNESCO. So um, I think, yeah, that you have a very concrete uh, example to show what the value of art and culture can be. So... <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. And because of my throat, I pass the floor again to Laura to say goodbye. Yeah. So as a final word, many thanks to the presenters, but also to the public. Um, I still had one question, I guess, from Kara, who wanted to, to ask, how did you decide on the topic? And with that question, we will conclude the evening so maybe one short answer how did you decide on your topic well i think for me it started uh, from i was really interested in like cultural policy and cultural planning themes and um uh, then especially i got interested in this topic of uh, capitals of culture and then um well, I'm kind of, I've always been interested in these participation topics. And at the same time, the kind of youth disillusionment thing was a current topic and then COVID-19 making like young people's lives even harder. So then it somehow, and it wasn't like, I didn't come up with the research question like that. Like I changed it a million times in the process, but it kind of developed like that. Um. Yeah, just before I started my thesis, I uh, did a course on cultural sponsorship and uh, patronage, and I really enjoyed that one. So uh, that's why I decided to focus on that. 
Um, and I was also very much interested in like the more psychological uh, dimension behind it, uh, especially when COVID came around uh, and I saw people asking for donations, mostly uh, not in the cultural sector, by the way. Um, I thought there's something in here and I want to know more about it. So uh, that's what I did. Yeah, I think uh, mine goes way back. Uh, actually, my my father took me to one of this, well, some sort of social circus initiative, but it was like polis. Well, it was like a governmental pro program. I was 14. And I remember how much I cried when I saw all those kids. And again, social inequalities, right? I'm from a very privileged um, area in Brazil. So I came to this place where it was, and those kids were, they did the most beautiful performance that I have ever seen, like more than an hour. And they were like at the end crying and saying where they were from with like proud and like, and I saw that and, and I remember that I just felt how much that meant to each of them. And since that day, I decided that I was going to follow this path of like cultural economics -ish and how to be there. So yeah, for me, it was this specific spectacle that came to, yeah, drag me to my, mm -hmm. my studies. Yeah. Perfect. Wonderful. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah, Laura, meanwhile, I could drink some water. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, I recovered. So um, yeah, uh, once more, indeed, also for the students, it's really inspiring to see what is possible eh, as uh, research topics. Eh? It can be very diverse, eh? but find the topic that you can really engage with. Uh, I think that's really important. And uh, we saw this evening uh, three very beautiful examples. Um, and uh, I hope the, the audience enjoyed it as well. Yeah, so uh, we will uh, share the recording, I think, yeah, uh, on our website. And um, yeah, I wish you really good luck in the future yeah, because uh, you are also continuing in your research. And that's really good, I think. Yeah, we need more research in our fields. Yeah, there is... Um, I mean, there is a, a, a big part that is really uh, valuable for practitioners, eh, but also it's important to further establish eh, our research as well. Uh, finally, I want to thank Laura. Eh, you did it in a very uh, elegant and very fluent way to uh, moderate the discussion. And uh, yes, I wish everyone a very nice evening and for... The, uh, Australia, yeah, <laughs> night or even uh, morning. <laughs> so, but thank you for being with us, Alice. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Many thanks and good evening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.